Hello, everyone. Today we're going to be talking about uh, equine immunology and um, how it applies to health and disease and um, the life of the horse. Okay, so the immune system is a system that is extremely complex. Okay, I am going to share this. Um, the screen here, but the immune system, as you guys can see, is extremely complex, okay? Obviously, this is a chart from 2009, so you can only imagine what has been found out for the last, you know, even the last 10 years, um, 11 years, I guess, and so it's a very complex um, system. The cells communicate uh, with each other via what we call mediators, and these cells, communicate um, and then they and then they start or or they trigger responses in a cascade kind of format so one cell triggers one that triggers the other that triggers the other and that there is like what we call there's what we call the inflammatory cascade um, so this is important for us to understand do we need to know this we don't this is for very very specific research uh, but we just need to know um, that this system is very intricate and we're going to learn the generalities of the immune system and how it affects health and disease. Uh, so a little bit of an immune response, okay, so uh, when the horse sneezes on us, does that affect us in any way? Uh, when we have a cut, what happens? When we have a respiratory disease, what happens there? And the uh, basis and the basics for uh, vaccination protocols. So just so we know, so uh, the immune system, the first line of defense is what we call the physical barriers. The physical barriers are going to include skin, mucous membranes, and they are physical. They are a physical barrier to protect our body from the outside world, okay? So this, uh, sorry, I cannot get to get a comfortable way for my chair here today. Uh, these physical barriers, they are physical. They are actually a physical, like a, a barrier that has nothing to do with um, antibodies or anything like that, or white blood cells. They are just a barrier itself. So when we have an opening, so when we have a cut, that is an opening from uh, in a break in this barrier from um, the outside world and gives a way in to our body. And of course, the body of the horse as well. When that gets broken and we're gonna have invasion and infection, we're gonna first trigger what we call the innate immune system, which is going to lead to inflammation. And the innate immune system later on is going to recruit what we call the adaptive immune system, okay? So the innate immune system, so first we have the physical barrier, physical barrier is broken. Then we're going to have the innate immune system, inflammation, and the adaptive immune system is going to be recruited. Put this guy there. So just as an overview of the lecture, so we're going to have, we have uh, pathogens all over the place, okay? And then we have pathogens here, bacteria, virus, fungi. We have barriers. We have mechanical, chemical barriers, um, some reflexes that we kick things out, or when we close our eyes, that's called the menace reflex. When something comes towards our eyes, we close so things don't enter our eyes. Uh, when that gets broken, the innate immune system gets activated. There's multiple cells that are part of the innate system, not just cells, but like, for example, fever itself is part of the innate immune system, and that is going to recruit the adaptive immune system and in the center of it all is this little thing that we call life, okay? So life depends on all of, this, uh, all of these uh, different types of immunity to uh, be working correctly. So what is immunity? What is immunity? It's a state of having sufficient biological defenses to avoid infection, disease, or other unwanted biological invasion. We have natural acquired immunity. So that's when there's three different types. The naturally acquired immunity, that is the immunity that we acquire after we actually have an infection 
itself. So after we have influenza, after we have the flu, we are going to acquire immunity against that particular strain of flu ourselves without vaccine, without anything. Then we have artificially acquired immunity and that comes via vaccination. So we vaccinate to stimulate the immune system to then when the immune system, when the body faces or has an encounter with that particular virus or bacteria, again, it already has a mounted up response against it. And then obviously we have the passive, passively acquired immunity, and that comes in the sense, because it's passive, so we haven't made it, it's something that we have received. In the case of foes or in the case of um, people, in the, uh, come in the form of colostrum. So the truth is foes are born, they are born immunocompetent, so they are able to start forming antibodies and fighting infections from the day that they are born, even though they are uh, very green uh, when we talk about it. But uh, they, the, the placenta from the mare to the foe doesn't allow for the passage of antibodies, and the foes are 100% dependent on, as they are born, to drink the colostrum from the mare. So if the mare needs to be very well vaccinated so she can have a lot of immunity and then she passes it on to the foe via colostrum and this needs to happen in the first few hours of life. Um, best in the first two hours of life, okay in the first eight hours of life and not okay afterwards. Because what happens is when the foe is first born, so um, antibodies are, pretty much proteins. And when the foe is born, his um, stomach is not set to digest protein just yet. So everything that is uh, sucked, so everything that he nurses is going to be absorbed in the, you know, straight to their blood. So that's when antibodies get totally absorbed by eight hours. It's actually by 12 hours and that 12 hours things start to shut. But from two hours and up, things start to shut and then the body starts to actually digest the protein as a form of protein. So even if they continue to drink the colostrum, um, which is going to happen because the mare produces colostrum for like two to three days, uh, they are just going to be taking it as just as milk as opposed to immunity. So when a foe is first born, he needs to drink, he needs to stand you know, between 30 minutes to an hour and he needs to drink the colostrum by the two hours of life and then you need to call the veterinarian. The veterinarian comes, uh, takes blood to see his IgG level, how much immunoglobulins that foe actually has if he is able to fight infection. Because if he isn't, if there is what we call failure of passive transfer, that means that this foe is in high risk of uh, infection and septicemia, and he needs to be treated uh, very, very urgently with heavy antibiotics, okay? So this is uh, what immunity is. So we have a little bit of terminology. Uh, so pathogen is a disease-causing organism, so it can be protozoa, fungi, bacteria, viruses, etc. Antigen, okay, it's any substance capable of generating an immune response. That's what an antigen is, okay? Antigen can be anything, like it, it's proteins and parts of bacteria, viruses, etc. So these little proteins are what is the antigen, okay? So pathogens are going to, call, to carry antigens with them. Um, we, it can also be what we call self-antigens, and it, that's when we have autoimmune diseases because the body loses uh, tolerance to itself. The host is the organism that harbors the virus or bacteria, so the organism that is going to have the disease. So the bacteria, the virus, is the pathogen is going to give the disease to the host, okay? Antibody is a protein uh, produced by the B cells and they are going to bind to the antigen. Here's the thing why I have this terminology is because a lot of the times people get very confused between antibody, antigen, and another word that we're going to uh, learn later antibiotics okay antibody antibiotic and antigen and anti-inflammatory are totally different things okay uh the cells of the immune system are called white blood cells okay and they are in the blood white blood cells we have also the red blood cells the red blood cells 
are what carry the oxygen. The white blood cells or leukocytes, leuco means white, cytes means cells, white in uh, Latin. And the red blood cells that carry the oxygen, just uh, for you guys to know, is called the erythrocytes, okay? Because erythro means uh, red. The innate immune system, so the word innate means you are born with it. So anything that is innate, it means that it's you are born with it, it is natural to you. So we are all, unless somebody has some sort of genetic defect, everybody is born with the same innate immune system, okay? And the innate immune system is going to act the exact same way uh, that in every person, in every animal, etc. of that species, okay? Obviously, we're going to work a little different than horses, but I'm just trying to uh, paint that picture to you. Now, they made, the innate immune system is going to have the phagocytes. So these are cells that engulf pathogens and chop them up and, you know, uh, dissolve them. Uh, so that's what phagocytosis means. And they are uh, done by phagocytes. And the phagocytes are going to be the macrophages, neutrophils, and dendritic cells. We're also going to have mast cells. Mast cells are uh, granulocytes. So they are cells that have a lot of uh, granules inside of them. And they are very much... Uh, going to be responsible for allergic reactions as well as eosinophils and basophils. There's also other cells called natural killer cells and they are also part of the innate immune system. Now the adaptive immune system, like I said, the innate immune system, everybody's pretty much born with the same, except for people that may have problems here and there. But the same goes for all dogs are born the same, all horses are born the same, unless they have some sort of problem. Now, now, the adaptive immune system is something that each individual has adapted themselves. So, for example, I am from Brazil. I have received so many more vaccinations than a lot of people in the United States have. Uh, and my, so my adaptive immune system, and I have seen and I have been in contact with pathogens that maybe he, people here have. And so my adaptive immune system is very different from people that are, say, born here and vaccinated with the vaccines that we have here. Uh, but the adaptive immune system is going to include uh, lymphocytes, okay, T and B cells, and the dendritic cells, as you guys can see, are going to be uh, part of both the adaptive and the innate immune system. So just so we can uh, know how this all works, we have these protective barriers uh, that is, they are made to protect the body from this invading uh, pathogens. Okay, there is multiple protective barriers. We're going to start with the mechanical barrier. So the mechanical, something that actually separates the pathogens from the individual. So we have the skin. Okay, the skin is this continuous layer of tightly packed cells, and they're tightly packed and they impede. So the epidermis impedes the entrance of pathogens of bacteria, of viruses, etc. Uh, when there is a break in the skin, when there is that break, then that is open to the environment. And we have, there's a lot of uh, pathogens all over, okay? Intrinsic epithelial cells, they are, uh, they are going to produce mucus uh, and they happen in the uh, respiratory tract, in the trachea, and the bronchi, so these cells, goblet cells, they produce a lot of mucus. This mucus is going to trap bacteria, viruses, any particles of certain size. And then we have uh, cert, uh, something that is called the mucociliary system, which is where the mucus is produced by the cells. This bacteria, fun, uh, fungi, any kind of particles bigger than like minuscule particles get trapped in the mucus and then the cilia in this, in the trachea and the bronchi, actually sweep uh, these uh, particles out and they come to the nose in the form of, say, snot, okay? Which, uh, yeah, that's exactly what I have. So we have these mucus cells um, and they produce, or they are called the goblet cells, and they produce mucus. This mucus is going to trap the pathogens or any kind of particle. It can be just dust. Dust is not, is not necessarily a pathogen. It can be pollen. It's not a pathogen, okay? Uh, they are just particles, and these particles get trapped, and then the cilia in the mucociliary system uh, sweep those particles away. 
Other part of mechanical barriers, we're going to have saliva. The saliva is going to dilute microbes. Uh, so this is just, it's something that when we're talking, when we're eating, we are ingesting these microbes. Uh, coughing and sneezing, that it's a very mechanical, physical way to expel uh, possible, part possible pathogens uh, and also all sorts of particles. Um, just, it's a mechanical uh, removal of uh, pathogens, okay? The flushing action of urine and tears, they also expel pathogens. So uh, there is a thing that the dilution is the solution for pollution. Uh, and that's where the saliva, the urine, and the tears, and anything that we can flush things out of the system uh, come into place because you're diluting uh, those pathogens. There is uh, any, any um, pathogen to cause a disease you have to ingest or have in, uh, been in contact with a certain number of them. So it's what we call the viral or bacterial load. And the more that you ingest or the more that you come in contact with, say, if it's respiratory, the more chance, the higher the chance of you having and developing the disease. Um, other mechanical barriers, so cilia. So obviously I say here uh, in the lungs, which is the uh, mucociliary system. And also they move the mucus and remove the microorganism. And also the intestines have cilia as well that maintain the movement of to make sure that um, the things get moving in the intestine as well. Uh, then we have chemical barriers. So those were the mechanical barriers. So it's still part of the protective barriers. We have chemical barriers. So our skin has what we call sebum and the sebum is produced by sebace sebaceous glands and they, uh, the sebum is going to in inhibit microbial growth. So our a healthy skin that's not super dry that's not super oily, that's just normal. Uh, a dry skin is gonna have some cracks that will uh, allow microbes to go in, but the sebum making the skin very pliable in, is going to inhibit uh, microbial growth. And then the skin acidity, so uh, the skin has a, a pH of 5.4, so it's a little bit more acidic than neutral, which is seven, and that also impedes uh, some microbial growth. Uh, we have some uh, beta defensin, so these are enzymes that will break down some of the microbes. And of course, we have the gastric juice, which is a very, very, very low pH, between one and three. And it is produced by uh, this, the stomach. There is glands in the stomach that produce there, and they will destroy most bacteria and viruses. Obviously, not all the bacteria and viruses. There are some bacteria and viruses that are very much so acidophilus for example they are friends of acid so they will uh, pass on and the same goes any disease that causes disease that is transmitted by the fecal oral route is diseases that you have ingested something and it passes on through the acid and goes on to form uh, to cause disease um, other part of protective barriers, we're going to be talking about the commensal microflora. So we are going to have the commensal microflora is microflora that's, that it's good bacteria and fungi, protozoa, etc., that live on the skin, live on the GI tract, and they are going to uh, be helpful to prevent and inhibit the growth of pathogenic um, bacteria, viruses, etc. How do they do that? They do that by two things. Number one, they compete for food. So there's only enough food to, uh, to feed enough bacteria, et cetera. Uh, so the more of the good bacteria that you have and they're using that food, the less food is going to be left uh, uh, over for pathogenic bacteria. The other way that they compete is for space. So there's only so much space in a person, in a horse's GI tract, et cetera, to grow just enough bacteria. You can't have more than that. So they're competing for that. And if you have a ton of good bacteria, probiotics, okay, they are going to be um, helping the, um, the, the pathogenic bacteria from taking over. So that's why they compete from, but, uh, with food for food and space. Now we're gonna be talking about once the pathogen crosses any of these protective barriers, uh, we are going to be recruiting the innate immune system. 
So when that happens, what is going to happen? Hold on just a second. I need to take a drink of water. Hold on just a second. Okay. Let's see this guy. Okay. So when we, when these barriers get, when these barriers get crossed, okay, we're going to have the innate immune system is going to be the first line of defense. Obviously, these barriers are the first line of defense, but if when they get crossed, they're uh, this pathogen, so the innate immune system is going to be recruited. Like I said, it's a built-in immune system to resist infection, and the pretty much the goal for the innate immune system is to try to break down and phagocytize um, as many pathogenic bacteria, viruses, etc., as possible. So then it also is going to present parts of these bacteria, viruses, etc., to the adaptive immune system to create an immune response. But one of their first goals is to uh, diminish the viral and bacterial load. So it's trying to like kill off any pathogens that we that they can to try to diminish the viral bacterial load. It is, uh, it's built in, it, the person, horse is born with it, it's present from birth, it's not specific for any particular microbial substance, it is not enhanced by second exposure. So this is something for you guys to think about, the uh, adaptive immune system is enhanced by second exposure. And this guy here has no memory, meaning it is going to act the exact same way for every single time that it sees the same bacteria, different bacteria, same virus, different virus, etc., and it activates the innate, the adaptive immune system. The, like I said, the innate immune response is going to slow the growth of infectious agents until the adaptive immune system is able to kick in. That may take a, a few days to weeks, okay? Um, microbes, as we know, is go are going to evolve very rapidly, and this innate immune system is going to focus on very broad characteristics of microbes. So not just the minute details between, you know, when, um, when different viruses uh, are going to uh, differentiate and, they, uh, and they're going to mutate. So these are going to be looking at very, very broad characteristics of these microbes and they are called pathogen associated molecular patterns. And these are structures that are element, uh, that are common, I mean, to broad classes of microbes and are, common to many different classes of microbes. So that's what the innate immune system is going to say, wait a second, this cell floating around does not belong to this body. And that's because it's a microbe, okay? Uh, the PAMPs are going to bind to pattern recognition receptors, okay? So here, for example, we have the macrophage. Uh, we're going to have um, the PAMP in the bacteria, and the macrophage is going to have a receptor on its uh, surface that's called a pattern recognition receptor and that is going to be all the time looking for PAMPs, okay? And when it finds it, it binds to the bacteria and then it engulfs the bacteria and causes phagocytation, okay? Or phagocytosis, I mean. Uh, they are on immune cells of the innate immune system and we have uh, a big part of the innate immune system is to have these phagocytes like I said, to be able to chop down all these uh, pathogens, to be able to eliminate them. And as they get chopped down, they also get introduced uh, and to recruit the adaptive immune system. So phagocytes, neutrophils, macrophages, macrophage, dendritic cells, Langerhans cells are uh, phagocytes. Some of them are part also, they are all what we call, um, they're going to present, pathogen presenting antigen presenting cells, and they are going to, uh, for example, macrophages and dendritic cells are part of that, so they communicate between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system, but for example, neutrophils are not, okay? They just, they engulf, they kill, and they die, okay? Um, so how are these uh, microorganisms going to be recognized by phagocytes? So like, for example, here we have the neutrophils. Uh, this is the this is the surface of the neutrophil. Like for example, if this is a neutrophil, they have surface receptors, okay? These surface receptors. 
And the macrophages, same thing, but they have different surface, re surface receptors, but this also, they're also called surface receptors. And these receptors are going to be able to, they are, they are um, sentinels, I could say. They are looking for microorganisms all the time, okay? And then when these micro when they're found, they attach to these receptors and they get engulfed, okay? Um, these structures that these microorganisms are going to have are not present on self tissue. So it's not something that we possess on our cells. Now, there are problems when we have autoimmune diseases, and that's when we lose self-tolerance, is that when our immune system, our innate immune system, starts to attack our own cells, and that is le uh, loss of self-tolerance, and that's a problem, okay? Uh, but in normal individuals, these uh, phagocytes are going to be selective for microbial patterns and something that we don't necessarily we don't have in our cells okay uh so how does phagocytosis happen let me go back here so these cells are going to have the receptors okay these receptors like right here is going to bind to the microbe i don't know why this does this it's going to bind to the microbe is going to engulf the microbe in what we call a lysosome okay and uh, these lysosomes are then going to be, um, uh, this, this um, cells, this like, um, how can I say, this sac, okay, that is going to be phagocyte or phagocytosed or whatever, is going to, this microorganism goes inside this innate uh, cell, say it's a neutrophil or it's a macrophage, and then they're going to be chopped up chopped up and then they're going to be killed inside the cell with what we call ROS. ROS is, stands for reactive oxygen species, okay? Reactive oxygen species is, um, for example, let me try to share something else. Um, if you guys remember, how do I share? share screen hold on if you guys remember one of the reasons why we take multivitamins is you know because vitamins and minerals is something that we have to eat uh, to be able to have a complete uh, number of them and we have this thing that's called free radicals Free radicals are uh, oxygen molecules that are going to be floating around and ready to react to anything. They are, there is also reactive oxygen species, okay? If you guys remember from chemistry, oxygen always comes in two molecules because they're going to have six electrons in the end of their last layer and they are going to be covalently bound to another molecule of oxygen, always forming two. So O2 is very, very stable, okay? It's while we breathe. How do I delete this? Eraser. It's while we breathe, and it is uh, very much stable. Now, reactive oxygen species is an oxygen that is by itself, and this is how the symbol is, okay? The reactive oxygen species is by itself and it's extremely reactive. It's ready to attach to anything that it sees. It's, that's why it's also called free radicals. So for example, uh, just to give an example, water okay, has two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen and it is going to be covalently bound, extremely stable because the hydrogen needs to bind to one uh, molecule and oxygen is to bind to two molecules. So this is extremely stable. But just to give you an example of something that is not very stable is this guy right here and it's called what? H2O2. It's hydrogen peroxide. This extra oxygen that we have, so we have O, H, H, and there's going to be an O 
that is going to be dancing around between uh, the hydrogens, the oxygen is just going to be reacting, reacting, reacting to everything. And when you put hydrogen peroxide on anything that is going to react, it forms the bubbles. Those bubbles is a blast of oxygen, and that can actually kill things, okay? One of the first things to kill, say, anaerobic bacteria, which is bacteria that don't like the presence of oxygen, is to actually blast them with oxygen, okay? So reactive oxygen species are extremely, extremely useful. Uh, this is what, so nitric oxide, it's another form. It's what these uh, phagocytes use to actually kill these microbials uh, inside their own cells. Uh, the other thing too is that free radicals, as the body is living, breathing, and etc. This is like why we take antioxidants because we are generating free radicals all the time and we're trying these antioxidants, oxidants, it's anti what? Oxygen species, antioxidants, which are vitamin C, vitamin A, vitamin E, it says zinc, they are very powerful to bind to this reactive oxygen species and eliminate them. And it, research shows how powerful they are to try to maintain health because the more of these guys that we have floating around our body, the more destruction they are going to cause, okay? And I hope you guys understand that. Let me continue to share here. And that's what the uh, neutrophils uh, macrophages are going to use to kill these microbes, okay? Um, so we are going to have the stages of antigen processing, uptake, degradation, and antigen presentation. Antigen presentation is now, so this uh, neutrophils macrophage is engulfed, this uh, pathogens, these microbes, and degraded them, destroyed them, and now they're going to present, they're going to take parts of, these, uh, of this pathogen back to its surface and present it to try to recruit the uh, adaptive immune system, okay? So just as an example, this is not an antigen presenting cell, neutrophils, but neutrophils is the most abundant uh, white blood cell that we have in the body. Uh, they're the most abundant, okay? The main role is to get to the site of infection and rapidly ingest the microorganism. It kills the microorganism via phagocytosis, like we already talked about. And this is what a neutrophil looks like. These are all uh, red blood cells. Um, and it is going to kill by using reactive oxygen species. And after it kills the microorganism, it actually dies also. Once the neutrophil kills the microorganism, it dies. And the mixture of dead microorganism and neutrophils is what is going to form pus, okay? Just so you guys, so the, the pus that we have, and that's why it's so nasty and can infect because there's a lot of bacteria in that pus and dead neutrophils, et cetera. Now, neutrophils die after they kill the microorganism. Uh, monocytes, they have this name when they are inside the blood, okay? They're bigger cells, but once they go into the tissues, they are called macrophages, okay? So when they are inside the blood, they're called monocytes. When they are in, out of the blood, because here's the blood vessel, okay? It's like packed also with cells. And then when we have an inflammation happening, an infection happening somewhere, these little guys come out and go into uh, the tissue. So this is the surrounding tissue, okay? The thing about macrophages is that they can uptake many organisms many times without dying like neutrophils do, and they are antigen-presenting cells, okay? Uh, macrophages are, dendritic cells are, neutrophils are not, okay? Uh, macrophages, so other cells involved in the innate immune system, uh, all the white blood cells, so we have macrophages, neutrophils, uh, eosinophil, is part of allergy, 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 uh, basophil, mast cell. All these three cells here are uh, what are called um, granulocytes. And when they uh, get to the area that is inflamed, they actually open up, they burst, and their granules contain uh, histamine. 
and histamine is going to cause be very responsible for a lot of the inflammation that is caused in an area but if you guys have been allergic to something like uh, poison ivy or any you know bee bite or anything like that that causes allergy that's the histamine that's there and it itches 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 and that's why we use antihistamine drugs such as benadryl and that has to do with allergy but eosinophils also has anti-parasite um, action. So when a horse is heavily parasitized with worms, for example, their eosinophil count is going to be a little higher than normal. Uh, um, and then mucosal membranes, basophil and mast cells, they go in the mucosal membrane. So like allergies that we see when because of pollen, especially here in Kentucky, we go outside and we have in the mucosal membranes, they actually come and just the grain, uh, the, the granulocytes come in and just burst. And uh, we have all these um, granules that have um, histamine in it. And that's why we become allergic to different things. And then our, our noses in, become super swollen, eyes super swollen, etc. We've been talking about the antigen presenting cells. And they, in this case, this here is a dendritic cell and the antigen presenting cell is the link between the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So we have learned how the innate immune system serves to try to decrease the number of invading pathogens, kill, 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 kill. And then a few of them are also going to present the antigen to recruit the adaptive immune system to try to form antibodies against it to continue to eliminate uh, those invading microorganisms. Um, oh, let me see. Hold on. I want to see where I'm going to stop this. So we are going to stop here. And then I am going to, on the next video, we are going to be talking about how the adaptive immune system is going to work.